Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for your sharing. I think uh, we've, we've now finished, and we have a, a 10 minute break until uh, we have the next presentation. The next presentation starts at uh, 2.40. Thank you. So just a short break. Before me or after me? Well, that's because that was the plan. That was the plan. We said a long time ago, and I never incorporated it. I'm sorry. Oh, you came out here and came to us. We, we, we planned it, and I never followed up. I have to repent. Cyclops can ask you for the follow up. Yeah. So, no, I think it's very good. An example. I'm just trying to think how my lecture finishes. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very good. Yeah.
Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Can we turn our chairs around? 
We're going to restart. <clears throat> Keith. Hello, Keith. <laughs> Sorry. Can we cha turn our chairs around and, and resume? Thank you. <laughs> Margaret, are you turning around? <laughs> Dr. Weiss. <laughs> do you want to come up? Do you want to? Dr. Lakshmi Weiss has asked to say a few words. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> Margaret? Yes, sir. Namaste to all of you. I'm Dr. Lakshmi Vyas. I'm Dr. Lakshmi Vyas, President of the Hindu Forum of Europe. And I'm really honored uh, to be here for this wonderful meeting. The first two speakers, David and uh, um, they were wonderful, I mean, excellent speakers, and it uh, didn't put us off to sleep. It kept us awake all the time. And I really, really congratulate them for this wonderful um, lectures that they gave us and the ideas that they gave, it to, gave, gave to us. So today, I would uh, like to um, fe felicitate uh, Margaret and Robin, and congratulate them for the kind of work they have been doing for such long years. And uh, with, a, with a simple shawl uh, that are, are from the Hindu Forum of Europe. Oh, I love you. You're so kind. It's our joy. Oh, thank you. It's our joy to prepare these events all our life. <laughs> Oh, you so know, beautiful. These, yeah. these are some beautiful shawls. Oh, look, look. Mm. How beautiful. Wow. Mm. Come, come here. Come to the center so that everybody can see. It goes well. <laughs> Robin, you have to. You better wear a shawl. I'll give it to your wife. <laughs> Gorgeous. Wow. Oh, you're going to, you can go with Ramaz. You Sorry. can become a. a, a and yes, yeah. <laughs> look, look at my, look at the camera. Oh, look at the camera, then. <laughs> thank you very much. I reminds thank me of. I reminds me of one uh, one of our message for peace. Uh, that passed away. Uh, uh, it was Chief Sanusi from Nigeria. She also gave us this uh, yeah. uh, and she did she did events here on mental health. But you will remember it forever. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Such an elegant woman, huh? So let's, let's go to our next presentation, again from uh, David Fraser Harris. And we're looking at coming together, the reconciliation, being conflict resolution. So please welcome Dr. David Fraser Harris. I want to call you doctor. Excuse me. My computer's been doing something while I wasn't looking.
Over there. Good afternoon. So this session is about bringing peace and reconciliation. And uh, I'll make some references to the previous ones as we proceed. Um, but I'm going to start with um, from the preamble from UNESCO. Since wars begin in the minds of men and women, it is in the minds of men and women that the defenses of peace must be constructed. In other words, we've got to start in here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm... Uh, from our founder. Why throughout history have people needed to improve themselves through morals, ethics, and religion? Why should we observe them? It's because we sense something is wrong with us, and we desire to t return to our original standing before God. However hard the original mind may struggle to attain goodness, we can hardly find any examples of true goodness in this world under the sovereignty of evil. Human beings have thus been compelled to seek the source of goodness in the world transcendent of time and space. This necessity has given birth to religion. Through religion, fallen people mired in ignorance have sought to meet God by ceaselessly striving toward the good. In 1994, I was paralyzed um, from the nose down, and I spent six months in hospital in Italy. And at that time, uh, I learned something about hospital. It's simple. Without it, I would have died. Second, I do not want to live the rest of my life in a hospital. Now, religion is actually the same. It's a restorative vehicle. So religion saves our life, but do, we don't want to live in a club all our life. We want to live with God. Yeah. The goal is all religions is to let us live with God, not in a religion. Amen. A religion is a hospital. It's a repair shop. It's the job of bringing us back. And that's what we're talking about now, the job of bringing us back to God. And if you know the word in Latin, re ligare, means to reconnect or to rebind. That's the job of religion. Uh, and it should be so good that it's no longer necessary. When we could have a world where God is present all the time, and we don't need religion anymore because it's done its job. So we should graduate from our religions, all of us. How do we change our nature? This is the work of religion. After something is wrong, you have to put it right. So if, for example, I drop a pen, I have to pick it up again and put it back in its place. If you lose somebody's trust by mistreating them, you have to do a lot of work to regain the trust of that person. So we have to put things right. And a lot of that's what's happening in our world. We have to regain trust. So the original position or status which might mean the place of the, pat, the pen or the relationship between you and me, if it's broken, it needs to be restored. So indemnity is a term in the principle for paying your way back, in, in another words. It's like restoration. It's an effort to reverse or restore something that was lost by taking responsibility and taking actions to correct weaknesses, misconduct, and bad habits. So it's what we do to put it right. So what is restoration? Restoration occurs when you find yourself in a similar to position to where mistakes were made in the first place. Oh no, not again. What we tend to think is I have a bad destiny because I have to meet this bad situation again. It's not true. You are lucky to have a chance to undo what you did wrong last time. What's the point? The point is human responsibility. 
many people in religion especially think God has made the plan, I just sit back and wait for God's destiny to happen. But actually, the fundamental important role of the principle, which echoes what is in all the existing religions, is that for God's plan to work, I must take responsibility. Why? This is in the very principle I taught earlier of creation, which is that if God wants you to be perfect, why doesn't he just make you perfect? Because it would be nothing to do with you. I would be a robot if God made me perfect like that. He makes us with a responsibility to grow. And that is the love of God. The love of God is to say, I trust you so much, I want you to make yourself into a good person. Do we understand it? That's the same as happening in restoration. God trusts us with our world's problems. He says, you can do it and make them right. And that's what's happening here. When you find yourself in a similar position, you have to face the same temptation to make the same mistake which would only continue the destructive pattern. But you choose not to do so. For example, anger. You know how easy it is to become angry. But anger happens in anger, it happens in a flash. So it's very difficult to stop in a flash, I know, from my own experience. But actually, we meet the same situation. We should be able to say, hang on, why am I feeling this? And if we stop, we can realize, actually, it's not that person's problem. It's my problem. Instead of acting out of your fallen nature, that's our selfish self, inherited from the original fall of man, you act according to your original nature and follow your conscience. In doing so, you break the cycle of abuse and the pattern of fallen history. Until restoration on a particular level, that's like the individual or the family, is accomplished, the same problems will reoccur. So why do bad things keep happening? It's because we have to learn the lesson and change the way we deal with it. And that happens to our society, to our family, to you and me all the time. And there are ways that the religions of the world teach us to deal with it. Because the most important thing is to come back to God. That's what religion is teaching us. Well, the first thing is myself and God. The, rec the restoration of the relationship between myself and God. And that is practiced in different ways by the existing religions. Study of scripture, seeking insight, prayer, meditation. I was happy to hear who's here who's doing a lot of meditation. Uh, Self-reflection, awaken the conscience, confession, restoring our love for God, celibacy, poverty, obedience. What are all those? Celibacy, giving up our selfish misuse of love. Poverty, giving up our greedy misuse of money. Obedience, giving up our self-centered use of power. The, all these things are problems for us, right? But then uh, religious vows teach us a different way. But that's the first step. The second step, it's not just good enough to pray. We have to be good. And the only way to be good is by treating other people well in the relationships we have with others. So here, we, have a st we start with self-reflection, but then we have to practice it in the relationship with others. If we say, I've meditated and I know I'm full of compassion, but if we turn around and mistreat our neighbor, it has no meaning. So that's why, in the words of the gospel, Jesus was quoting actually the Jewish Torah when he said, we have to love first our God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and all your strength. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. So these are two secret ways, simple ways of setting right our relationships with God and with each other. And success in both areas is needed to mo cl move closer to the goal of peace. If we look at the Bible account, as uh, Michael spoke of in his presentation earlier, uh, the problem started with the parents, with the misuse of love on the part of the parents. But 
The ones who suffered were the next generation where we see one brother murdering the other brother. The story of Cain and Abel. This is very, very instructive archetype of conflict. And we can learn a lot from it, from the way nations relate to each other, from the way we relate to each other. And for me, this is one of the things that helped me to understand that this was not just stories from the Bible. Because when I, when I first met the unification principle, I didn't believe in God. I was polite to the people, and I said, okay, I'll listen to what you say because you're nice people. But I didn't actually believe much of it. And then they started saying, oh, and then there was Cain, and then there was Abel, and then there was Noah, and then I thought, I have to listen to all these stories. <laughs> but but I, actually, at a certain point, they said, um, we want you to act it out. You're Cain, you're Abel. Sort it out between you. And they started putting people into situations where you have to feel, well, if I'm in this position, how would I behave? And you realize this is something very real. So I'm talking about Cain and Abel, but don't worry. It's about you and me. Uh, so they, God wanted Cain and Abel to love each other. He had a good purpose. So actually, if you know the story, I don't know how much you know it, but it's good to know that both in order to try and put right the mistake by their parents, they were both asked to make offerings. And the offering of Abel was accepted, but the offering of Cain was rejected. So how does Cain feel? Angry, jealous, and upset with his brother. But actually, something's going on here. They're having the opportunity to correct feelings which they've inherited by dealing with them differently. So that's what's happening right from the beginning. God, sa God says to them, to Cain, he says, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? Do you not see that evil is knocking at your door? Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Has evil ever knocked at your door? Selfish feeling, anger, jealousy. Evil knocks at our door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. In other words, it's not bad if we deal with it. We're supposed to be the masters. We're supposed to be the sons and the daughters of God. So if evil is there, we have to deal with it. That's our job. Abel loved God. But he could not win the heart of his brother, who was consumed with resentment. Abel had God's blessing, but he didn't share it to help his brother. Cain was consumed with resentment over what he thought was injustice. He didn't see his brother from God's point of view. He was jealous. He was unable to control his anger, and he murdered his brother. You have a look at a lot of the political and military actions in our world today. You'll see they're following similar patterns mm -hmm. on both sides. What should happen? And this is where you and I come in. We have to deal with it. So we have to be like Abel and we have to be like Cain. Because sometimes we're the one who's closer to God and sometimes we're the one who's got evil knocking at our door. It happens to all of us. Abel has to be humble. In other words, if you are <laughs> the great spiritual leader, first thing is we have to be humble. If we have something to share, we have to be humble about the blessing from God. We have to be forg forgive, be tolerant in the face of abuse. Serve your brother. Why? To melt his resentment and be ready to mediate. What about Cain? What should I do if I feel supremely angry and mistreated by somebody? I have to overcome that resentment and that feeling of rejection. I have to recognize the value of the other person instead of thinking of myself. Maybe the other person's doing well 
for a good reason, which I haven't noticed. I have to rejoice in my brother's success and move on from hatred and be ready to reconcile. So it's never one way. Both sides have responsibility. Again, responsibility. It is not destiny. There is destiny. God destines, wait for it, only goodness. <laughs> That's what the principle says. God destines only goodness. Everything else is where we mess up. So in the situation like this, there is a good destiny, but we have to take responsibility to make it happen. Reconcile with each other according to some of the world's religions. The repayment of a bad action is one equivalent to it. But whoever pardons and makes reconciliation, his reward lies with God. He does not love the unjust, but whoever endures patiently and forgives, that is a sign of real resolve. If you're offering your gift at the altar from the Bible, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Where there is forgiveness from the Adi Grant, there is God himself. So, let's look at uh, one way that this was practiced in another story in the Bible, which involves the two brothers, Jacob and Esau, who are born as twins. And what they are doing, actually, is they're being given the job to undo what Cain and Abel did. So, Jacob is in the position, even though he's the younger brother, to be trusted by God and his mother helps him and he ends up uh, being the one who buys in a story the birthright from his older brother whose older brother wants lots of food and I won't go into the story it's too long but he buys the birthright and then later he receives the blessing originally intended for the older brother it comes to the younger brother with the help of his mother who can see he's the one who can really lead the family he builds his family and his wealth in another country in 21 years. He is mistreated many times by his uncle, who's in charge of the whole land there. But in the end, he comes back after 21 years. He has a fight during the night with the angel, and he wins. And then, at the very end, he comes to meet with his brother. After 21 years. Now, Esau feels hard done by because he was supposed to inherit and this other guy got was supposed to be mine so he has been hating his younger brother for the last 21 years so when Jacob comes to meet him Esau comes with 400 soldiers you can see, see what he's thinking but Jacob what does he do he sends the first amount of his property then he sends everything he's earned over 21 years of work. And then when they meet, he bows down before his younger brother and says, when I see you, I see the face of God. Even though this is the one that was trying to kill him. And they are reconciled. Esau had to deal with the fallen nature that is within every single person. Sometimes we don't see God's point of view. He certainly didn't there. He couldn't see why God wanted to trust his brother. And then we leave the proper position. You remember those four steps that Michael gave us? Four steps into doing things the wrong way. These are the four steps. And after leaving the proper position, we say, I, I, we can, I, I know how to do this better. And we take over. We start getting other people to do our bidding and we multiply the evil we're doing. These are a bad, slippery stairway into the multiplication of evil. That's what Esau had to deal with. So how does he deal with it? How do you make sure you don't fall down the stairs? This is the way. You have to love that measly younger brother from God's viewpoint. You have to be ready to receive love through that younger brother of mine. Well, maybe God wants me to learn something from him, to serve him, and then to learn God's way from him. This is 
a formula. It's a formula that worked in the case of Jacob and Esau, and it's a formula that can work for you and me, and it's a formula that was applied by Father Moon when he went to meet Kim Il-sung. You probably know the story. I don't know how much you know that Kim Il-sung... Uh, okay, so... Um, in the early time that he was teaching about God, Father Moon went to North Korea, even though it was already communist, and ended up being imprisoned there for two and a half years under the government of Kim Il-sung because he'd been teaching about religion. I can't tell a long story, but he managed to, because of the United Nations intervention, he came south uh, and built up the whole unification movement in its various different forms that you can see. While that was happening, for example, in the 1980s, um, the FBI arrested agents from Kim Il-sung who had come to America to assassinate him. So in 1991, that's less than 10 years later from this assassination effort, he finds himself traveling to meet the man who tried to, who imprisoned him for two and a half years and tried to assassinate him. And he said, I went to treat him as my brother. It's not easy. I'm not sure I could do that. I can think of similar situations on a smaller scale where I would rather not go to the meeting because I might just get angry. Get angry? or say something terrible, honestly. Um, so if I did that, it would only make things worse. See, he traveled to Hawaii for days and days and days and prayed and prayed with one object, to make sure his heart was clear before he went for that meeting. Yeah, because his children said to him and his wife, you're if you're going to this place, why are you packing this kind of clothes? Because he went to Hawaii, which is hot. Then he was going to Korea. But they were reconciled. There's a long history of that, which I'm not going to go into here. Um, and I'm going to show how this applies on different levels. So this archetype of conflict between Abel and Cain, we see happening at different stages in history. And Jacob and Esau stood in a position to undo those, that conflict. That was passed down through their descendants so that we have the civilization of Israel descending from Jacob and the civilization around Greece and Rome at the time um, of Jesus' life. And those two represented Hebraism or the Jewish faith-based approach and Hellenism, which was a more uh, philosophy, wisdom, uh, and physical world-based uh, approach. And these two coincided at the time of what's known in history as the Axial Period, from 600 to 400 BC. All these religious prophets, leaders, emerged in this time in uh, China, India, Iran, or Persia at that time, uh, and of course Greece. And you can see the emergence of different spiritual roots in a certain time period in history. Um, and uh, these are the words of an English writer who uh, I'm coming to respect quite a lot the more I read about her. Uh, she wrote, as far as these sages were concerned, respect for the sacred rights of all human beings was religion. If people behaved with kindness and generosity to their fellows, they could save the world. And she's talking about the religions of the world. And she's studied world religions. We need to rediscover this ethos. We must learn to live and behave as though people in countries remote from our own are as important as ourselves. Don't you think that's true? Very true. Did you read the news of the oldest woman in the world who died last week? in France, uh, aged 118. Wow. And uh, she was uh, a nun, 
And uh, at one point, she said, the only thing we have to start doing is just taking care of each other and loving each other more. It's like su such a simple message after 118 years. But it's the same as this message. So restoration history means we have to undo the conflict and we have opportunities to do it. So as it happened between individuals, it happened on a family level, it happened on a national level at the time of uh, Jesus. Uh, but then it's expanding onto a worldwide level as we look at the ways of life that find their roots in uh, an able type view, in other words, faith, religion, and a Cain type view, in other words, uh, the, the capacity to organize the world systematically, which is, uh, you'll see what it comes to. Then we need to look at what we call Cain and Abel positions. I'm telling you it's a formula. So the formula works for our lives. That's why I'm talking about it. Um, and uh, the purpose is relational. We need to solve this inner relationship. It is not good and bad. Do you understand? Even though one may be closer to God and can be used by God to help the other one, like Jacob could help Esau, it doesn't mean Jacob's perfect. Do you understand? In the same way, even though Esau had a problem, it doesn't mean he's condemned to go to hell forever. God wants them to sort it out, to undo the problem so that there is harmony. So in the same way, Cain can come through Abel by uniting to make a harmonious solution. My body can come through my mind, follow the direction of my mind, and I start becoming a whole person. This is coming back to the original ideal which I talked about earlier, but now it's in a correctional mode. So it's not just saying we should ideally have a united mind and body. It's saying my body is selfish. I have to force it to follow the direction of the mind by spiritual discipline. That's the point of coming back. So in the same way, a devotee follows a guru because a guru can guide them. Communism has a lot of capacity in the world and a lot of danger, but it had to come through democracy. And any issue in human society, you can take a cane type view, which I guarantee will include complaint. <laughs> Guarantee, if you see complaint, that's the Cain type view. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It means it's not good enough. And then there's an able type view, and the two need to work together to find a solution. So this has to happen inside you and me as people. It has to happen in the way we deal with people. So Martin Luther King Jr. says, we must discover the power of love, the power the redemptive power of love. Redemptive. We're getting things st set straight again. That's what we're talking about. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. We will be able to make men better. Love is the only way. It's possible by applying this principle. We never get rid of an enemy by meeting hate with hate. We get rid of an enemy by getting rid of enmity. I'm sure you understand. And this is speaking from prison when he was unjustly imprisoned in the 1980s in America. But what does he say when he's in prison? I'm teaching you to love those who hate you. If you love them, sooner or later, they will come to like you. If you return good three times, for every time someone does you wrong, eventually that person will bow his head. Try it yourself and see if I'm right or not. Everyone has a conscience. Taj Hamaskol, the second UN Secretary General, I see no hope for permanent world peace. We have tried and failed miserably. Unless the world has a spiritual rebirth, civilization is doomed. So it's up to us. It's our choice. We can repeat past conflicts or we can resolve them. Unresolved problems will be passed on to future generations. And in most cases, they will be bigger 
and more difficult to solve. So, it's not such a comfortable way to finish, but it's the reality. If we want to put things right, we can, and we should. And I think we will, won't we? We will. <laughs> okay, I want to invite up to speak um, Patricia, um, who has some very good examples of reconciliation to give. Do you need a computer? Thank you very much. Thank you for this beautiful lecture. Um, I just wanted to share, we've been doing a lot of peace work, peace and reconciliation. I've been um, uh, having a peace meeting for 30 years for women uh, of all race, culture, faith, no faith for peace. We have a lot, a lot of experience about trying to build relationship. It's not always easy. We think about peace, everything is nice and easy. But there's so much internal struggle unless we make effort. But I just want to share, we have been, I think, seven times to the Holy Land, uh, you know, uh, for March. It's a, a special project from our Peace Federation. It's called MEPI, Middle East Peace Initiative. And um, so we would go with interface group to the Holy Land and go there and join other groups from all over the world and go for a march for peace. We will join peace. Shalom, salam alaikum, peace in the Middle East. I don't know if you remember, I think some more people. And the first time when I went, I, was, I brought a whole group, and I was just so <coughs> eager, you know, to do something and to meet the also Jews and, and Palestinian and try to work together. And I, but to be honest, my experience was very, very hard the first time. And uh, I could very easily relate with the Palestinian because they are just so hospitality, and it's just they treat you so, even they're so poor and they need a lot of help, but you could feel really so much for them. You want to help them. But I found it very, very hard to relate with the Jewish people. I found it very harsh and very, really, really hard. And, and I felt somehow, because when you go as a peacemaker, you want to create a platform where people can come together. And I just felt something wasn't right. And I said, I completely failed you know, to try to connect with Jewish people and to, uh, to bring together. And I really pray, I remember, I pray with my whole heart and even I cry and I say, God, I completely, I'm not happy because I feel such a strange feeling in my heart, in, my, in myself, I even don't want to go back. And I remember I went to the plane, literally, it's a true story, and I was waiting to go to the toilet and I see that elderly Jewish lady looking at me and then she came to me and she said, I would like to speak to you. And uh, I didn't want specially to speak to anybody. I just was, I, I, I wasn't in a good place, to be honest. Uh, and I, but then because she was elderly, I said, okay, I should really make the effort. So I came back from the toilet and I sat down with her. And then she said to me, I wanted to talk to you because I saw you in my dream. Can you believe it? I was absolutely stunned, really. I couldn't believe. So I felt at that particular time I had to listen to her, you know, and listen to, to what she had to tell me. And uh, she, for the whole time we spoke for three hours, she spoke about her fear, being Jewish and going and being afraid to send her children, not knowing they come back, you know, in the evening, being afraid to go to the marketplace. And she was, and I just could feel then her <coughs> vulnerability and how much so the Jewish people need a lot of healing, especially coming from the Holocaust. They really, so to do peace work, you have to, you know, look at both sides. And uh, after that, I felt really that was something that God taught me that I had a block in myself, I had a blockage in me, to be honest. And I had really to, to realize, gosh, we have to look at both sides. That's God's point of view. We have to bring the two together, like when uh, David explained the two sides together as a peacemaker. And I just quickly, very quick, I want to show you some of our experience in the Holy Land. Oh, doesn't work. Maybe. Doesn't, sorry about that. Yeah, we had a, I, I don't want to, just one, e one experience. Where is it over? Anyway. So we, 
we had a chance when we went to the Holy Land to, be, to meet a lot of interesting group. And one of the group really that I want to share, yeah, that was the Women Interface Encounter. They are a wonderful group of um, Jewish and Palestinian and uh, they do amazing work in the Holy Land. And they really put their life on the spot, really, to come together, to meet together. And they came to Birmingham and to London and to, to talk about our, uh, in, uh, in our peace group. So it's very nice when you go there and you bring people back and they share about their story and it really moves people's heart and then they want to do something. You know, it's not only going there like as a tourist, but to really be involved and you are moved by something happening there, you want to bring it back and spread it, you know, in a good way. And that is some of our group, we travel, we had, uh, we went, I think, around seven times there with interface group. The first picture was uh, Hindu and uh, Christian. The second one was Sikh and Muslim. And that's a whole group of my Muslim friends from Birmingham. We all went there together. That is an amount of beatitude. It was a really wonderful experience. And then we joined a whole international delegation of 1,200 people mm -hmm. who were marching in, the, in Jerusalem, to remember Margaret and Robin, we were together, and it was really the most amazing experience to, to come together and show sol solidarity for the Jewish and the Palestinian to bring peace. And then both sides also, that is at the Holocaust, some of my Muslim friends, they came and gave flour to the, to the relative of people who died, the Holocaust, which was really hard to do, and take some courage. That is a beautiful uh, bridge of peace you know, between Jews and, and my friend, my Muslim friend and a Jewish, like a, a symbol of friendship and reconciliation. Um, and then there also we met Bishop Ria, Bishop of uh, Jerusalem and the bereaved families. And we invite Bishop Ria to come back to Birmingham. And he spoke, uh, he was hosted by the Lord Mayor. He spoke at, spoke at the council house and we support him for his project, amazing project, to create a school where Jewish and Christian and Muslim children could study together to resolve all their conflict by making friends with each other. Because I, I really believe to solve these problems through friendship, we get rid of fear and prejudice towards one another. And then that was what I wanted to explain more. It was, we met really member of the Parents Circle and Family Forum. They are really amazing people. They lost their loved ones, especially their children, uh, through the war. But they are amazing people because they can swallow up their pain and turn it around the power of forgiveness and reconciliation. And we were so moved that we invite them to Birmingham. It was a whole project. And, and to, to come and to speak to, to schools, to young people there, and to really show young people it's possible for Jewish and Palestinians to work together. We had an elderly mother who lost her child through suicide bombing, a young Palestinian, and his, his brother was shot at the head at the checkpoint. And to be honest, they were like mother and son. And we went for 10 days, we went to visit school, and the young people were in tears. It was so good to give the good news that it is possible, to have real example for our young people. Also, they spoke at our peace meeting at the synagogue, in the mosque and also at the university. It was just really a project we never forget. We would like to do it again, in fact. Yeah. And then to finish, <laughs> we have a very, all our, our elder member from our group, she's 102 years old, wow. uh, is Hus, she's Jewish. Mm -hmm. And she came also here to England, to Birmingham with the, uh, what is it, the train? Yeah, the kinder train. Kinder yeah, and uh, so she was welcome by a Christian family, you know, but they never wanted to change her face. They respect her face, and they really show her so much love. And then even they spend the money to bring the parents back, you know. Yeah. And I tell you, that lady, she's really, she has so much to offer. She's always there at our peace meeting, even though, you know, she's always there with her Jewish prayer. So I think this kind of people can teach you so much about life and about forgiveness, yeah. yeah. That's what I want to share, thank oh, you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. So let's get into our small groups again. So uh, each time maybe the group could be a little bit different. If you want to vary it, do you want to vary it? 
So how about the front row here, moving across to the front row over there, and the front few rows there. And then, I, I think I'll leave it to your creativity after that. If you want to change your, your group, just, that's right. So let's go across rather than front and back, okay. So we have 13 minutes. Has everyone got a group? If you don't have a group, just join one that looks a bit small. Margaret, could you mobilize, could you form a group with David and, and Kulip and There we go.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Of course, you can continue these conversations, but now we have a break until 4 o'clock. If you want to get some tea or coffee from downstairs, you're welcome. Also, let me, if someone's really got something they, they want to say to camera to reflect on today, Ernst is just outside. It only has to be one minute or... Oh, it's very short. One minute, two minutes. Uh, but please share your reflections. That'd be wonderful. We, we love to hear them. So Ernst is outside. He's the one with the camera. He's recording someone at the moment. OK, thank you. So come back at 4 o'clock.
<laughs> oh, power. <laughs> there we are. Well, I've been encouraging people to come up. <laughs> yes, please. It's, um, it's a hard thing to get people to come from a break. <laughs> but we have something very special coming up, UPF Secret. So maybe I'll just wait a minute or two for people to come. But how has today been? Have you enjoyed today? Yeah? Oh, very good. Lucilla, did you speak to Ernst? Did you, did you uh, record a testimony? No. Very good. Recorded. Yep, you recorded. So before you leave today, if you have some inspiration you want to share, then please see uh, Ernst. He's the one who usually is at the back with the camera. Uh, currently, he's uh, downstairs in, his, in our recording room. But uh, there we go. We're very grateful that uh, you could all come today and dedicate this time to, to understand UPF. Uh, UPF comes from a very deep root, as you've been, you've been hearing. Some of these uh, principles can be looked at in more depth. And if you're, you want to hear more, then please speak to one of the, the presenters, or myself, or Margaret, or David, or Patricia, and then, then we'll help you. But there's a, there's a lot more. Today is a, a taste. Sometimes we used to go for weekend seminars in, in Wiltshire, uh, which was lovely in the countryside, but we'd have a, a bit more time. But these can be gone into in much more depth. There are many other things going on also in, in the UPF realm. And uh, I, if you are connected and attending our, our different events and programs, you will you will understand and hear about them. In May, for example, there is something special happening which may be shared about, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, we have a very special event happening in Korea. We will also have a world summit with many VIPs, former heads of state, etc., will be coming in the same manner as uh, some, the video that you saw in the beginning of today. I think we have a quorum now. So I'm, I'm going to uh, hold, hand over the microphone to Dr. Michael Barkham. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I'm almost the last speaker. And for those of you who have to go all the way back to Birmingham, you can almost feel the car is warming up, but not yet. <laughs> Um, also, we've already given thanks to Robin and Margaret, of course, but I'd like to give a word of thanks to Joe at the back, who's doing the tech for us. And he told me it's the first time he's ever done a program live on Zoom, on Facebook, and on YouTube, all at the same time. So I expect a big job offer will be coming in before the end of the program. Also, um, I want to thank the team that made all the effort to provide the lunch. I understand that there were caterers from Birmingham who provided much of the food. It was so delicious, amazing, thank you. And frank confession, I have a few leftovers in my fridge. But also to um, Anne and uh, Joyce and the young volunteers, they probably can't hear you, but why don't we give them a big shout out of appreciation to the cooks. All right, so I'm supposed to tell you about the UPF secret. That's almost an oxymoron, right? If I tell you about it, it won't be a secret anymore. So I've changed my mind. I'm not going to tell you. Oh. <laughs> no, actually, I am. Uh, really, this is more of a summary. And then I'm going to invite you to take action in a special session with David and Patricia. But 
just to remind ourselves, um, what have we already heard about today? Well, we heard an introduction to UPF from Margaret, very personal one. Uh, we heard from David about the principles of peace, uh, and then from me about the root of conflict, and then again from David about the road to reconciliation. And as Robin just mentioned, for those of you who feel, well, I really would like to hear more, let me invite you personally to come to Prague next month. We have a one-week seminar with sightseeing in the beautiful city of Prague. Uh, there'll be people from all over Europe and the Middle East. So take your time off work, book your cheap ticket to Prague, still very cheap, and, and come and join us for a wonderful week in Prague. So what's next? Well, first of all, I want to say a word about the founders. Uh, in fact, before I say that, let me say, Happy New Year. You think, what? <laughs> yes, in Korea, it's just turned midnight, oh. and we have entered the Lunar New Year or the Chinese New Year. So turn to your neighbor and say, Happy New Year. <laughs> That's it. And who knows what year it is? It's. It's the year of the rabbit. I don't know about that. Last year was the year of the tiger. I identified with that. I got a nice tiger tie. Uh, year of the rabbit, hmm. Anyway, <laughs> rabbits run fast, and Mother Moon said in her message, well, at least everyone likes rabbits. So um, it is a new year. And also, next uh, Friday is the what would have been Father Moon's 103rd birthday, and Mother Moon's 80th birthday, and I'm not sure, Robin, do we have a card? Did that ever happen? Well, we will have one by 5 o'clock. So if you'd like to just scribble your autograph on a birthday card, uh, which will be at the back there, uh, we'll send it off to wish Mother Moon a happy birthday. And next Sunday, uh, we will be holding a birthday celebration. If you come down to our other Peace Embassy in South London, uh, there'll be food and Korean snacks, and uh, special rice cakes for the new year, or maybe there'll be some in Birmingham and elsewhere. But anyway, I'm excited because the founders changed my life. And as a gift for you when you go out, I do have a copy of Father Moon's autobiography called as a peace-loving global citizen. And I thought I'd show you just one story from here. So you probably know Father Moon is a Korean, and when he was born in 1920, I said 103 years ago, he, were, he was born in what is today's North Korea. Now, when you hear North Korea today, you think missiles, crazy things, and maybe also you know about the dreadful starvation and human suffering there. Well, 100 years ago, and, uh, and for 40 years, Korea was a colony, a colony of Japan, actually. and. Uh, Yes, it, it was a pretty brutal time. The Japanese were very keen to bring their culture to Korea. So they, they made Japanese the official language in the schools. And they looked very cautiously, shall we say, at Christianity and the other faiths of Korea. And when Father Moon was about 10 or 12 years old, he had an experience that really transformed his life. Not a religious experience. This is more like a, an experience with justice and righteousness. So I'll just tell you this story so you can imagine yourself. Don't close your eyes, and you may imagine too deeply. Uh, it's a cold winter's night in January about 1931 or 32. Father Moon, he's 10 or 11. And uh, late at night, there is a, a sudden knock on the door and opening the door, there's a group of 10, 12 people. And he knows one of them. It's his great uncle, Yungook. Now, great uncle Yungook was one of the great patriots of the Korean resistance and liberation movement. And that was a, a very challenging thing because it was suppressed severely. So late night, here comes his great uncle Yungook, almost a, a and almost a mythical figure, together with 10 or 12 followers. And they are desperate. They're hungry, they're tired, they're wet, they've been walking in the snow, and they're on the run because the police are hunting for them. 
So they're quickly invited into the family home, and Father Moon, this is all in the book, Father Moon's mother quickly kills a chicken, or maybe two, <laughs> and starts to make them chicken soup. And the children are there. Father Moon actually had a lot of brothers and sisters, but of course the parents try to put them to sleep. And a Korean house doesn't really have bedrooms like a British house, so they're, they're off in one corner with a blanket over their heads, and they're supposed to be sleeping. But you imagine a 12-year-old boy with this kind of hero figure in the corner. He's not doing any sleeping. <laughs> and he listens to their story of how they've been trying to win Korean independence and you know, the injustice and the struggle they've faced. And this story goes on all night long. And by morning, he really wasn't a boy anymore because he'd made up his mind, I am going to fight for the freedom of my country. A few years later, he had an even more powerful experience, which you can also read in here, where he realized that actually to free one country alone is not enough. Actually, he had an experience with God which told him, you know, you have to fight for the freedom of the world. So uh, I encourage you to, to read about that. Um, actually, of course, he passed away 12 years ago. Uh, but in this book, you can read something of his life course and some of the many projects that he started. And just one quote from it. I have lived my life with just one thought. I wanted to bring about a world of peace, a world where there are no wars and where all humankind lives in love. I think we'd all agree with that, right? That's our purpose in life as well. Uh, there's another book, which I don't have here, but you can buy it on Amazon. And this is Mother Moon's autobiography called A Mother of Peace. And in particular, as you may have heard, she's really focused on encouraging women to take their rightful role as leaders of peace. You know, in fact, she said, the time has passed for the logic of power, which is usually what men are interested in, to be honest and to replace that with the logic of love. And I'm really inspired to see, I think, more than half the audience today are ladies. So consider yourselves called to action. Today I invite women to accept an important role and become the turning point in building a new century characterized by a loving, peaceful culture. So UPF secret, actually there is no secret. What there is, is a lot of hard work. And not only that, but we want you to find a place where you can get involved. Many of you are involved already, actually. So I thank you for that. Uh, here's one. The, we were the first, I think, to create a, a multi-faith seminary, the Unification Theological Seminary in New York. Actually, this is my alma mater. I took two degrees there, a master's and a doctorate. I think, David, you were there, and others. Um, Robin was there. Yes, where is Robin? He's hiding. Yeah. Uh, and we have online courses. And we have scholarships. So if you're interested in higher education, or you know a young person who'd be interested in taking a master's in peace study uh, or a similar project, I encourage you. The website's really easy, uts.edu. And we're always looking for bright young people and young at heart people who would like to further their education. Out of that came a project called The Assembly of the World's Religions and a book, a publication which you see here called The World Scripture. It's a beautiful book. It explores all the common ground between the different faiths grouped under different topics, compassion, God, forgiveness, and so on. Father Moon said, actually, 90% of what religions believe and teach is the same. But somehow, we end up focusing on the 10% that's different. And so instead of cooperating as we should, like one team, we are just like individuals on the field. You know, a, a football team that has only individuals and no teamwork is doomed to failure. I know, I support one myself. <laughs> uh, and another project particularly aimed at Christianity was the new ecumenical research uh, or, association. But you see there Father Moon talking with pastors at the dinner table, asking them, you know, what are your ideas to change this culture of competition into one of cooperation? And one that you've heard a little bit from Patricia and others is the 
aim to have young people of different faiths work together. Because if they work together young and become friends young, that friendship will last their whole life. This is uh, the religious youth service that started about 40 years ago now. Another project that particularly was important after 9-11, I know a long time ago, is the World Summit of Religious Muslim Leaders that took place in Indonesia, December 2001. You may not know this, but when, uh, when the 9-11 tragedy hit, Father Moon himself was in Alaska. It was just at the uh, end of the King Salmon season, and he was a keen fisherman, and he used to like to go to Alaska each fall to kind of refresh himself, go fishing, commune with God. And so the last thing, of course, that he expected to hear was this catastrophic attack on America. And unusually, he came back and he locked himself in his room for three days. He didn't come out. Uh, and later on, he explained, I was praying desperately to God that this would not be the beginning of a religious war, that you know, there would be an opportunity to try to bring peace and calm. And this uh, conference was led by the late president of Indonesia, Abdurrahman Wahid, actually blind, but very spiritually well sighted. Another project that we're proud of is our efforts in Nepal. You probably know that 15 years ago, Nepal was on the verge of civil war uh, because communism, the communist and Maoist groups had come to power, but they couldn't agree with each other. The monarchy had been deposed, and there was on the verge of a genocide, of retribution, but somehow, and UPF played a role in this, there was an effort to practice the principles of peace and reconciliation that David mentioned in his talk. Some of the UPF members went into parliament and amazingly uh, found a way to work together with people who you'd think would be the very opposite of what UPF teaches. I was in Nepal in 2018 for the Asia Summit, and it was amazing to see how completely the government, which is almost entirely nominally communist, was working side by side with religious leaders, with people from the United States and Oceania. So this is really part of the secret of UPF. Somehow we can find a way to let people work together. Why? It's easy. We're all made in the image of God and the likeness of God. If we remember that, then there's really nothing that we cannot do. I had a very personal experience of that one time. I, I found myself really angry with a group of people, actually in my own, <laughs> in my own community, because they just wouldn't listen. They, they wouldn't stand to reason. They were fighting with each other. Everything was falling apart, and I really felt like screaming at them. And then I heard the quiet voice of God, and God said, you know, you don't like them because they're not like you. You look at them and you think, they're not in my image, they're not like you. But I want to tell you, Michael, they're in my image. So if you can't love them, you can't love me. Wow. Maybe we've all had that kind of experience, right? It was right in my face. Another project that uh, I invite you to participate in, because it's an easy one, is the Peace Road. So the, the idea of the Peace Road started with Father Moon's vision that if the world could be connected physically by roads, by bridges, so that travel was easy, life would be very different. And he envisioned a, you know, a highway that would go up through Korea and China, across the Bering Strait, through Russia, across the Bering Strait to Alaska, and down into mainland America. If we had such a bridge, would there be war in Ukraine today? I don't think so because we would be traveling and sharing and communicating. So even though it hasn't happened, uh, we're doing little pieces that we can, and it's like a citizen's peace initiative to come together to walk or to cycle. Last year, we walked across the entire country from the west to the east, from Carlisle to Newcastle along Hadrian's Wall. You know, Hadrian's Wall was a bit like the Berlin Wall of its time. It was an eight-day trip, I know David, uh, Earl was there walking, and some of you, it was amazing. And there we are meeting with the uh, mayor of Carlisle at the beginning. And also, you heard about this vision of a reformed United Nations. This is actually in Korea. I guess it's two years ago, right before COVID, we had five or 6,000 people 
And you heard about the unlikely partnerships. I mean, Hun Sen of Cambodia. Cambodia doesn't have a great record, let's be honest. Um, people like Mike Pence there from the former Trump administration, you'd think, well, how could they possibly get on the same podium? They, they hate each other, but somehow they managed. And, you know, we are a family. Um, we try to imagine, you know, in a family, you can't kick anyone out, right? You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. They're chosen by God. So if Father Moon was here today, I mean, he's not, but if he were, I think he would challenge us to act. And this is a call to action that he gave a few years ago uh, in New York. I'm going to read it to you. It's a bit long, but I invite you to follow along. I will take the lead, he said, in establishing true families, true societies, true nations, and the true kingdom of the peaceful ideal world. True in this sense means like the original idea of God. Will you join me? as I rise and gain strength in accordance with heavenly fortune, or will you remain captive behind the same old walls, all of them Satan's handiwork, the wall of your religion, your culture, your nationality, and your race, and spend the remainder of your time on earth in agony and regret? Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with your religion, your culture, and your race in itself, but if it becomes a barrier to listening to and hearing from other perspectives, then indeed it becomes a wall. And as he said, later you will regret it. I know that because I regret the years in which I didn't do it enough. Heaven is summoning you to be the wise leaders who will set aright this world of evil and establish a new heaven and a new earth, a new culture and an ideal kingdom. Now, them fighting words, right? That this is time to make a stand. It's time to make a difference. And one way that this can be done is through what we call the cross-cultural marriage blessing. So Father Moon is very plain about it. He said, look, the world is divided. Nations are divided. Religions and cultures are divided. How are we ever going to change that? My solution is that people from these different cultures have to marry each other, they have to love each other, they have to show that the power of love is greater than any divisions that human beings have made. Imagine two enemy families, he said, who have cursed each other throughout their lives, people who would never dream of living together. I think we can all imagine some families like that. In fact, we may know some families like that. What would happen if those families joined together through a cross-cultural holy marriage blessing. If a son from one family and a daughter from the other became husband and wife, loved each other and built a happy home, would the parents in these two families curse their own children? Actually, he had a vision of Russians and Americans marrying each other, Ukrainians and Russians and so forth, because that would bring peace. If that son loved this beautiful daughter of a hated enemy and she, as the daughter-in-law, was to give birth to heaven's grandchildren as pure and clear as crystal, the grandparents would smile with pleasure. In time, the two lineages, once soaked with enmity, would be transformed. And uh, this is a picture of such a cross-cultural marriage blessing showing, as you saw earlier, how the clergy of different faiths stand up to pronounce the blessing of their tradition on all the couples who are gathered. Now, some of those couples are getting married that day for the very, for, you know, it is their marriage, but others are rededicating or recommitting uh, their marriage. I had a very interesting experience with that uh, in 2010. We had a blessing ceremony at the Sun Moon University in Korea, and actually there was a UPF conference at the same time, and the UPF participants were invited, hey, would you like to come along and observe uh, this blessing ceremony. So they said, well, what does it involve? So we explained a little bit about the principles of peace and about how these couples were making a commitment to world peace. And then somebody um, said, well, do we have to be just observers? Couldn't we participate? You know, couldn't we find a way to add our voices and our commitment to this? And of course, this is exactly what happened. And it turned into this beautiful outdoor 
amazing blessing ceremony. And good news, there'll be an opportunity to participate in something like that today. And even better news, it won't be outdoors. It will be right here in this room, uh, and you won't have to get cold. I'm going to leave you with uh, the motto of Father and Mother Moon that kind of gave them their life's purpose. Go forward with the heart of a parent in the shoes of a servant, shedding sweat for the earth, tears for man, and blood for heaven. So the heart of a parent, what is the heart of a parent? I'm, I'm a parent of five children. And um, you know the truth is that you love each of your children equally, but differently, right? You, as a parent, you can't say, well, OK, I have four that are good, and eh, one's not so good. So let me just say I have four children from now on. You know, It doesn't work that way. You can cut off your friends. You can leave your job. You can change your community. But your family is forever. So the heart of a parent is embracing everybody regardless. However, however, and I have lots of experience of this, and if my children are here, they will tell you it. You can't be the kind of parent that says, OK, you do this, you do that. I'm the parent. Listen to me. I know best. Dad knows best. That goes nowhere. Instead, you have to walk in the shoes of a servant. You have to be willing to serve, to keep silent, to endure any manner of difficulties. And you have to cry. You have to cry for people who are suffering. You have to cry for people who are in difficulty. You have to sweat. You know, It isn't a matter of just talk. You have to walk. You have to do it. And in the end, you have to be willing, as Jesus said, even to offer your life. Of course, hopefully that will happen. But it's a good thought, right? Sweat for the earth, tears for humanity, your blood, your very soul for the sake of God so that we can build the world that we're all looking for. So God bless you, and thank you. I'm going to invite Robin back, and we're going to go into the last action session. So wasn't that wonderful? Did you learn a secret? <laughs> Actually, there are, there are many truths which are unknown. Some, somehow, we, we already know it. But it needs someone to reawaken us to the reality of it, because it's, it's too hard. And, and it means that we have to, in a sense, go beyond ourselves to kill our, our ego, <laughs> uh, to, to reach to it. And, but it's great to have it refreshed, reawakened, enlivened. And that's what today was about. Uh, we have two more things to do. Uh, one is I'd like to, to welcome up uh, David and Patricia. I, once more, and then after them, we will have an ambassador for peace award. There we go. So please welcome David and Patricia. Do I need to <laughs> explain? For those of you who are not from Birmingham, David and Patricia have been doing a very sacrificial work for 30 years, probably 30 years, I, in Birmingham. Uh, both with Women's Federation and with UPF. And uh, they have been doing incredible work. But w one thing that they've done in a very large level is, is sharing of this blessing, the cross-cultural blessing that you saw. So I, I, anyway, I'll leave the next step to them. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for making the effort to come here and uh, stay here through the day. Uh, you've come from near and far, but uh, if you were standing here looking out, uh, we are the world. It's amazing. We represent so many cultures and uh, faiths and racial backgrounds and so on, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, so if you wish, we'd like to invite you to take part in this uh, very simple ceremony, but very deep ceremony, uh, the Interfaith Peace Blessing. And uh, we've heard a little bit about it from uh, our two speakers, eminent speakers. 
Uh, in Birmingham, as was mentioned, we've held it in um, Pentecostal churches, several, a Unitarian church, the Anglican church twice, uh, in, a, in Hinduism, in a Krishna temple, and in an Arya Samaj, if you know the different branches of Hinduism, uh, in an Islamic mosque, a Shia mosque, as well as other public places. And each time it's different, and each time it's very uh, both personal and public. We feel that uh, we're doing this together. It's taking, we know it's taking place all over the world, and there's a certain sense of individual participation, but also solidarity with each other uh, in building this uh, better world. Uh, there are just briefly two purposes, I would say, two main purposes. One is, uh, as I think Dr. Mike mentioned, we're about to enter the Lunar New Year. Of course, we're already still at the beginning of uh, 2023. So the purpose is to make a new start. Uh, personally, and in our couples, in our families, and all together, to make a new beginning. And uh, I feel that's absolutely needed in our present day society. And to have that sense of newness and uh, renewal and uh, revitalization as we try to take something away and move into action. And the second purpose is really to invite God's blessing. It's the interfaith peace blessing. Uh, individually, as couples, as families, as a community, but not just to invite God's blessing into our personal life, but to be a conduit, a vehicle, that that blessing can flow out uh, into the wider world. So when you go home into your family, when you go to work, into your workplace, into your social life, uh, that we can invite God's blessing on all of us together, but that it can really flow through us out into the wider world. And uh, again, that we can act, take uh, action. Uh, my wife's uh, mantra from Mother Teresa is, not all of us can do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. So I hope you can do lots of uh, small things with great love uh, when you go home, when you go to work, uh, next week in your social life and so on. So I think we'll... Um, oh, the other thing to say is if you're here uh, individually, uh, as an individual, then you can drink. But if you have a husband, a wife, a partner back home, then when you take this uh, holy juice, think of that person, think of your family, your children, your relatives. And um, uh, But if you're here as a couple, one or two of us are, then we'll share the same cup. But otherwise, uh, when we stand and take this uh, juice together, then uh, drink, of course, for yourself, but also thinking about your husband, your wife, your partner, and your immediate family and your wider family. OK, you have a choice of juice or water. <laughs> yeah, we'll share one between two. Uh, when the couple takes the juice like this, then we ask the um, better half to drink first. Uh, drink half, and then she gives it to the husband, and he drinks the other half. The wife as the mother, the giver of life. So if you'd like to stand. everybody have a, a cup of wishes? And then we'll, we'll take this together and then I'll say a, just a short prayer. So perhaps we can just say first uh, to one another and to those watching, uh, peace and blessing. Peace and blessing. Let's take the Holy Juice together.
Okay, I'll just say a short, uh, short prayer. Our loving God, uh, we, all of your children, you, our heavenly parent, uh, thank you so much that we could meet together today uh, personally here in this room and those of us joining together online. Uh, thank you for the presentations and the wisdom flowing down uh, through our speakers, but also from our different faith traditions. We pray that uh, as we come towards the close of this day, we can feel a sense of uh, oneness, togetherness as brothers and sisters. And when we uh, go from this place, we can really uh, take and share uh, your blessing with our family, immediate family, with all those uh, with whom we come into contact. Uh, and we can really take that simple but uh, deep action of sharing your love with the wider world. We thank you for everyone's participation and involvement today. And we want to offer this whole occasion to you. And we offer this prayer together most sincerely in your most holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. You may not have a, a sense of, uh, of uh, tomorrow being the, the start of a new year. To me, it's also it's a little bit strange. I, I'm very much rooted in the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> I know uh, different religions have different, different calendars. And we're rooted in uh, many ways by our, our years of life in a particular way of, of thinking. But in uh, one sense, um, it is quite an auspicious day to, to finish um, on the, this uh, uh, lunar calendar, finish the, a particular year, and then look forward to a new year. I kind of like the lunar calendar, because if you didn't make a, a good start with your resolution with a Gregorian calendar, you have another another start a few weeks later where you can restart so let's let's look at it this way that this is a, a good restart for for all of us um, we have two ambassador for peace awards uh, to present and again i'd like to invite up patricia uh, to to introduce the awardees Thank you. Um, yes, I would love to invite uh, Mrs. Neza El Kafir. Shall I do it first? Yeah, David. David, you can come here. Shall I? Uh, yeah, Mike. Yeah. yeah, Mike. Can I read? Dr. Balcom, could you could you join us, please? If I can bring my wife. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we? We give it first, huh? I like that, yeah. Okay. Shall I read first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we invite uh, Mrs. Nez El Kafi. Um, in 2017, His Majesty the King Mohammed VI appointed Mrs. Nez El Kafi as Secretary of State for Sustainable Development. Then on October 9, 2019, he appointed NESA as Minister Delegate of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, African Cooperation, Moroccan Residing Abroad, and in charge of Moroccans Residing Abroad. NESA has several university diploma. In 2002, she had a master degree in sociology from the Sorbonne University in France. Um, and she has conducted research regarding immigration, the integration, immigrants, and Muslim in a plural society. Her political career, she served as deputy in the House of Representatives for three successive terms, 2007, 2011, 2017. She was a member of the Parliament of the Council of Europe from 2011 to 2016 and a former prize, vice president of the House of the Representative of Morocco between 2016 and 2021. Okay.
Salam alaikum. Euh, merci Patricia. Merci l'UEPF. Euh, en vous remerciant, je veux juste partager avec vous deux éléments de cette belle réunion, de ce beau moment qu'on vit ensemble. Sorry. Um, she said thank you very much for this lovely day and she wanted to share two points from this day. Le premier c'est à propos de mon pays, le Maroc. About Morocco, her country. C'est un pays millénaire. En fait, on parle beaucoup, c'est un pays beau, méditerranéen, mais on sait peu de son histoire. C'est le modèle de l'intégration, c'est le modèle aussi de la cohésion sociale et de la bien de, de, de le vivre euh, ensemble. Uh, it is a very beautiful country, but it's also a, a model of cohesion, social cohesion and uh, cooperation. L'ADN du peuple marocain, c'est vivre ensemble, musulmans, juifs et chrétiens. Et tous les étapes constitutionnelles du Maroc et ont été marqués par cet ADN de la multiculturalisme et, le, et la, cette cohésion sociale qui était aussi imprantée l'histoire du Maroc. So the, the constitution in Morocco is really based on this unity between uh, all religion. It's very much ingrained in the Moroccan culture and history. Et je vous donne quelques exemples. Le Maroc, depuis des siècles, il a introduit l'institutionnalisation de la communauté juive au Maroc. So it has um, um, implemented the in integration of the Jewish, um, how do you say, the Jewish communauté in Maroc to really work together mus Muslim and Jewish. Yeah. On, a, on a des tribunaux juifs, on a un code de la famille juive et on a aussi des, comme on a euh, les immeubles, on a aussi les, tout un écosystème représentatif de la communauté juive religieuse marocaine. Mais le plus important, qu'on est marocain, qu'on sait qu'on est marocain au-delà de nos différences. Et c'est le plus important en fait, substance marocaine. Et à la fin de mon petit mot, je vous visite. Et récemment, Sa Majesté a inauguré la, une très belle instance à, 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 à Issaouira, Beit Dakira. Issaouira, c'est en fait une maison qui rassemble et qui reflète cette euh, histoire millénaire du Maroc. If I can translate all of that. <laughs> anyway, the idea is to really have a Jewish constitution and Muslim constitution. It's so integrated and the majesty built a beautiful place where people can come together, integrate for all the religions. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Merci beaucoup pour l'UEPF, merci pour la mobilisation et merci pour toutes ces personnes, femmes et hommes et jeunes qui sont engagés pour la paix dans le monde et la paix sur soi-même. Merci. Thank you. <laughs> She said, thank you for everybody who is engaged for peace and thank you for everybody here. Thank you. 
And then um, the, the other person I wanted to recognize is uh, Sadia Ahmed. So Sadia is an intent coach and facilitator, uh, know thyself, an uh, introspective process of inner transformation in UK, in London, a journey of profound learning with Etsko Shwitema, a friend and mentor st started in 2003. She participated in the Leadership Care and Growth Model Program in Pakistan, and soon after she traveled to South Africa for a five-day personal excellence program, an exceptionally insightful paradigm shift experience. Since then, she has been on a mission to connect people to their inner nature of benevolence and intent to give unconditionally enabling peace and harmony in oneself in relationship with others and more broadly in dealing with the natural ebb and flow of life to triumph as authentic human being. Yeah, I met um, Sadia in Birmingham. She's a friend of my friend in Birmingham. And I was just so moved by her. We always kept in touch. And she kept uh, on Zoom as well. She really does a wonderful work to help people in for their inner transformation. So I want to say thank you very much. Yeah. Thank Don't worry, I'm not going to give another lecture. <laughs> but I did promise you there's a very simple oriental style birthday card here. And if you would like to just sign your name for Mother Moon on her 80th birthday, then it will be at the back by the books on the table. And by the way, I would really like you to take a book uh, to read. I, I think you'll find it rewarding and happy. So thank you, Robin. But we'll use this, I think. Later. So. If you'd like to sign it, it will be at the back. One more round of applause for Robin. So uh, in closing, one, of course, I wish you all a safe journey home and that you can bring the spirit and the feeling you have to your home. To, uh, um, we have an event on February 7th, which will be uh, uh, celebrating World Interfaith Harmony Week, uh, which will be very special. David and Patricia have been organizing it. Uh, we will be sending you invitations soon. Uh, we also have a, an event here on January 31st, which will be Humphrey Hawksley looking at peace and security, and basically looking particularly about at the Indo-Pacific. Uh, he's going to He's written a number of books about the area and reported as a BBC reporter for many years. So he will be here on, on January 31st in the evening time from uh, 6. Uh, so you could join us then if you, if you want. It will also be online. And on February 2nd in the afternoon, we have a Nepalese cultural function, uh, which will be here from 4 to 6. So those are some of the some of the events that are coming up, uh, but you're welcome to join them. You can uh, always connect through David and Patricia, through Margaret, myself, and we'll be constantly sending you invitations about the things coming up. Thank you so much for coming today. And uh, anyone wants raffle tickets? Margaret's the, the lady. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your, your attention and for your participation today. You, you made today special in all, everything you did. We're very grateful for your, your presence. And we look forward to meeting you next time. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, do you want a group photo? Oh, please come up on here. So we'll, we'll stand on the stage, we'll stand on the, the floor, we'll have some seats as well in the front. Yeah, Daria, come on. Daria, we love you so much. Daria, come on. No, you can give it to Ernst. Give it to Ernst. Ernst will take Later. Can you do one after? After. Yeah, come on, Jason. Yeah, Daria, come on. You look tired. You look so tired. Oh, we made it. Mrs. O should be there. This is for the university. Love. Can I have a picture of you? 